Hey guys, Guitar Shop TV, and we are thrilled to be here with the legendary guitarist Don Felder, formerly the Eagles, and he's got an exciting new solo album out after, is it 30 years, Don? 30 years since yeah. the last one. Yeah. So Don, welcome to Guitar Shop TV. Oh, fantastic to be here. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here doing this and on the Gibson bus, as you know, and uh, can't wait to uh, let everybody hear, hear some of the new CD. So, now, Don, tell us about this. I mean, first of all, um, just taking a step back, it's been 30 years since you've had a solo project out, uh, and this is so exciting. I, one of the one of the singles is Girls in Black is already on the classic uh, rock charts. That's right, yeah. Last time I checked, it was in the 30s on the classic rock chart. Uh, it had been a few years uh, since I actually left the Eagles, and when you're in the Eagles, that's just all-encompassing. You can't do anything but either be on the road be on television and rehearsals, whatever you're doing, it's all about the Eagles. And then when I finally left the Eagles, I spent some time writing a book called Heaven and Hell, My Life in the Eagles. And going through that process, I really had to go back into different areas of my life and take a hard look at how I had gotten from this little dirt road in north central Florida to being in the Eagles and finally leaving the Eagles and what had changed and what had happened to me in the process. So I finally wrote this book called Heaven and Hell and in doing so I learned quite a bit about experiences that I had had. So I wanted to write songs for this new record from those experiences. It's a bit of a musical autobiography so all the songs have some really strong human content and experiences in it that everybody can relate to. That was, I mean, that was a traumatic time for you. I mean, obviously, you know, a lot of emotion there, and it, it comes out in heaven and hell. How how did that translate into Road for uh, Road to Forever? It was actually easier to release those emotions and put those mu emotions in music than it was in the written form. To me, music is a, an expression of uh, emotions and ideas, and it's easier for me to portray those emotions and get those feelings across musically than it is in the written word. So I found it really easy to transcribe a lot of those ideas and concepts from the written experience into songs. Uh, and every one of the songs has a specific kind of area of my life and experience that I went through that wound up being in the lyrics and feelings of these songs on the new CD. Now, um, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, growing up in Gainesville, Florida. You tell the story at age 14, you, you first um, saw B.B. King, and, and I guess you, you knew Dwayne Allman and, you know, um, learned some slide from Dwayne. And uh, tell us about that. Well, Gainesville was a really unique kind of little microcosm of a lot of people that no one had guitar lessons and uh, musical teachers. The, there were no schools in the in the time in that town. So everyone kind of learned by ear. Uh, Stephen Stills and I had a band together when we were about 15. Our parents would drive us around to different little gigs and stuff because neither one of us could drive. When Stephen left and finally moved to California, Bernie Ledden replaced him in the band, who was later in the Eagles with me. One of my early guitar students in Gainesville was a scrawny, buck tooth guy named Tom Petty who was playing bass in this band called the Rucker Brothers Band, and he wanted to play guitar instead of bass. So he came to me, and I started teaching Tommy guitar and working with the other guitar players that were in his band because they were both just, just strumming, flailing artlessly on guitar, and they needed to understand that one guy needs to play rhythm while another guy plays lead. So I just kind of helped sort out some of their stuff. Um... Uh, one of the other bands that was in that area was a band called the Spotlights, or later they were called the Almond Joys, and later they were called the Almond Brothers. And everybody played in the University of Florida fraternity parties after uh, homecoming weekend, or every weekend we'd, one of us would be playing at the uh, fraternity parties. But during the summer when the University of Florida was out of session, we'd all go over to Daytona Beach, which was an hour or so away from Gainesville, and we'd work the clubs over there or the pier. We all had gigs over there during the summer. That's where the work was. So I became friends with Dwayne and Greg, and their mother had a house in Daytona Beach. So after we got through with our shows, we'd all go to this diner and hang out and have some breakfast at 2 in the morning. And then we went over to Dwayne's house, and I remember sitting on the floor with him and him showing me how to play slide guitar. I'd seen people play acoustic slide, blues guys and right. stuff, but Dwayne had an un 
uncanny ability to translate that into electric guitar. And I was always fascinated with it. So he showed me the tunings and the basic positions that he used and so forth and so on. And I never tried to emulate Dwayne or copy him, but he really gave me the basic foundation of slide guitar. And I used that throughout my whole career. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of slide guitar on this new record, Road to Forever on a lot of the songs. It was one of my uh, fortes and what got me into the Eagles was playing slide guitar on a track called Good Day in Hell. Um, and then once I was in, in their band, I wound up playing everything from pedal steel to mandolin to banjo to acoustic guitar, anything that had strings on it. I got delegated the responsibility to learn how to play. So, But there were a lot of people in Gainesville that went on to become platinum selling artists and rock and roll hall of fame inductees that it was somewhat like Motown. It was like a really unusual right. little area of, 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 of music capital that was going on there. And um, a lot of people came out of that area and went on to be successful. It's remarkable. It's a great, that's a great story. You know, one thing, um, you know, about your playing, because uh, it's, it's, and I'm not blowing smoke, we just were talking off camera about uh, one of these nights. That solo it's got to be one of the most exciting and well-crafted solos in rock history. Am I, and I'm not, I'm not, how did you, uh, you know, did it just happen or did you like deliberately, because that, what's that, there's three guitar tracks going on in that song? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, I learned my musical phrasing from horn players. When I grew up, my dad used to love horn bands like Benny Goodman and those guys. So I grew up listening to horn players in my house and the jazz fusion rock band that I had that wound up moving to New York had a brilliant keyboard player in it that played Hammond. And he also played uh, soprano sax, not like Kenny G, but more like Miles Davis. Right. And the phrasing and horn players, they can only play a, a line for so long and they have to stop, take a breath, and continue their phrasing. So there's deliberate pauses in the way they construct their solos. As a matter of fact, the solo in one of these nights really should be Dave Sanborn playing that. It's a it's an alto sax solo that was phrased just like a sax player would play. And so I thought it was most appropriate to play a part on guitar that sounded more like an alto sax player, but done on a guitar. And another example of that sort of phrasing is those shoes that's got dual talk boxes that sound like two trumpets should be playing that line. So a lot of my phrasing is, is really based on horn parts, the way horn players phrase. So that's where that idea came from. In Hotel California, I mean, it's such an iconic song. I mean, when you think about it and how that went down, is there anything you would have changed or done differently all these years later? Well, it's interesting that you asked that because when I first realized and, and got the initial inspiration for the music for that song, I had a little four-track studio in the back bedroom of this beach house where my one-year-old daughter, when she was awake, I would go in there and record song ideas. Um, so I went in and had the initial inspiration. I just recorded the 12-string part over and over and over for about 20 minutes and so I wouldn't forget it. And then later I went back in and said, I want to take this track and I'll write a bass part to it. So I made up the bass part and I had a little drum machine that played like a drum pattern and stuff. I said, this would be a great feel for me to play something and Joe to play something. So I picked up a Les Paul and I kind of wrote what I would play and then I said, ah, Joe would play something like this and I picked up a Tele or a Strat and played kind of what he would play. And then when we got into the studio, uh, I originally wrote the song in the key of E minor, which is a great guitar key. It's got a lot, a lot of bottom in it and stuff. So we recorded the entire track in the key of E minor. And then Don Henley went out to sing it, set up a mic, and his voice was like Barry Gibb. It was really way too high in that falsetto kind of voice. And I said, that, that just doesn't work. We've got to lower the key. So I went out with an acoustic guitar and dropped it down to D minor, and it was still too high. And I dropped it down to C minor, and it was still too high. Dropped it down to A minor, which is a good guitar key. It's too low, but it wound up being in B minor, which is not a particularly friendly guitar key, you know. Um, but we just transcribed and transposed all the tracks. We went back in and recorded the whole track again in B minor. When we got to the end of the song, I thought we would sit down with Joe and I in the studio, plugged in. I'd record a line, and he'd play a line, and I'd record a line, and he'd play a line. And that's really what we started doing. Don Henley walked in the control room and said, stop, that's not right. That That's not like the demo. And I said, 
I don't remember what I played on the demo. That was like a year ago when I made up all that, those guitar parts. He says, we got to play it just like the demo. So I had to call my housekeeper in Malibu, have her find the cassette, if anybody remembers what a cassette was like, put it in a blaster, play the song, and she held a phone up to the song, and we recorded it in the studio in Miami. And I had to sit down and relearn what I had just made up like a year before verbatim. So... Um, in one sense, it probably worked out better because sometimes your best creative ideas are the best. Right. And when you just ignore them and go on and try to do something else, they're not as good as the original ones. And Don had the, the brilliance to say, no, it needs to be like the demo. And that's how it wound up being pretty much what it is on the record now. Well, we're doing a, uh, some larger festivals later in the year before it gets too cold. Uh, we're doing a swing through the West Coast, including L.A. and Phoenix and Vegas. Uh, back here in New York uh, for October 13th, we're going to play another club here in, in New York City. Uh, pretty much from now until probably the end of next summer, I'll be out on the road playing these new songs and doing shows uh uh, to promote this. I love to play. It's just nice to have new, fresh songs to get up on stage and play for people. People love them already uh, when we play. A, we just did a date up with the Doobie Brothers in Seattle. It's a big, uh, I think it's called the Washington State Fair, and it's like about 30,000 people. It's just nice to be on a big stage like that. Played two of the new songs, and people just loved them. Uh, it's it's great to go on with new songs and have people kind of get off on them. It's, it's, it's very exciting. Yeah, it's rewarding. Well, I carry six different guitars on the road with me, none of which are old classic pieces. I used to use old classic stuff, my old 59 Les Paul and old Strats and stuff, but I'm so afraid they're either going to be broken, lost, stolen, or damaged that I leave all those things home locked up. Tom Petty had some stuff stolen yeah. recently, right? And I have exact replicas made of the stuff that I had from Gibson. As you know, there's a Don Felder uh, yeah. Hotel California 12-string or double neck 1275 and a Les Paul as well. So I use those in the show. And then I have other instruments that I use the, for strats and tellies and acoustic guitars as well. But uh, for pedal board, it's a pretty small, basic little system. I, I use a, a Boss Echo. I use a... a, a OCD distortion pedal, and I use a Boss Chorus, and that's about it. You know, if I can't get it out of three pedals, then it's not to be had. It's in the hands. It is in the hands, absolutely. You're right, yeah.